Welcome to Building Sustainability Podcast with me, your host, Jeffrey Hart, aka Jeffrey the Natural Builder. Every fortnight, join me as I talk to designers, builders, makers, dreamers and doers, exploring the wide world of sustainability in the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. Hello and welcome to episode 82 of the Building Sustainability Podcast. This episode was recorded at the beginning of July and features Chris Magwood as our guest. In this episode, we are predominantly talking about the beam calculator, but I think the larger topic is calculating material carbon or what you might call embodied carbon or upfront carbon. So within that, we talk about how it's calculated, how to use the beam calculator tool. Uh, There is a link to the beam calculator in the show notes. Um, There is also talk about whether it's okay to offset stored carbon against high embodied carbon materials. And then we look into some real life cases where uh, Chris and his team have looked at all the new houses built in particular areas, Nelson in British Columbia uh, and Toronto and now Vancouver as well. And they've actually accounted all of the material carbon and then made suggestions on how it can be be improved and there are really really interesting results from that um, as you will hear Uh, we also talk a little bit about uh, chris's new book uh, build beyond zero Uh, that's with him and bruce king Uh, again link to that is in the show notes yeah it's a great episode i can't wait for you to hear it um so a couple of things to say before we get going There was a little bit of uh, recording difficulty. Normally I get two lovely sides of the conversation. So if I have a little drink while Chris is talking, I can just remove that side of the conversation. Something went wrong beyond my control and uh, that didn't happen. So I had to edit it from a a lesser quality recording. Uh, So apologies if you hear me uh, gulping or stirring some tea um what else to say you are quite possibly going to hear an advert in the middle of the recording it is a new thing i am trialing to see if it's worth it if it's really detrimental to your listening pleasures yeah we'll see let me know what else to say oh yeah uh i do a a stupid and uh i thought i'd leave it in so it's useful for everyone else uh i've been using the beam calculator to look at my house and uh there was something that i thought i thought there was a strange result and uh and chris very kindly told me that uh i just wasn't doing it right um so listen out for that uh i think i uh, that happens just after i've said it's very easy to use uh classic foot in mouth behavior uh from jeffrey hart just quickly before we get into the episode i want to say a huge thank you to rebecca armstrong and Martin Brown, who are new patrons. Uh, They have signed up to help support the podcast and keep it going. I can't really overemphasize how uh, thankful I am for that. Um, It really does help. Um, If you also would like to become a patron, you can go to patreon.com forward slash building sustainability. There is a link in the show notes. Uh, Much appreciated if you can. Okay, that's it. I am back at the end. Enjoy the episode. The beam calculator started as the the tool that I built for myself for the master's thesis I did a few years ago, where I was trying to. you know, get a sense of what the material related emissions were for residential scale buildings, which kind of hadn't, most of the work that I'd seen at that point was really focused on large buildings. And I was interested in residential buildings and in particular um, residential buildings with um, bio-based materials in them. And so I had started that thesis by uh, assuming that I would use a, a tool that already existed, but as I kind of experimented with all of them, they they all had some version of an issue with either being 
having all the right materials and assemblies for residential scale, you know, low rise structures um, or not being based, the data not being all based on environmental product declarations, but kind of being a, a, a mix of, of data sources. And all of them had issues with how they kind of, um, you know, figured out the carbon storage side of things and, and attributed that. And so, um, yeah, step one of that project ended up being kind of building out uh, a tool for myself to use for that project. And then once I did that and started, you know, publishing some of the results, I both got inquiries from people like, what tool did you use to do that with? And can we use it? And and then sort of realized, oh, yeah, I've kind of made something that that doesn't exist and other people are interested in that. So um, it took a, a couple of years to kind of build it from the the sort of unique version that I had made for myself uh, into something that that uh, that was generally usable. So, yeah, now that it's we released the the, the kind of public beta version, we call it uh, in May. And uh, we've got over 600 users signed up now and, and getting used to it. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's an attempt to try to make doing, you know, understanding the, the emissions that come from your building materials as simple as possible and as comparative as possible. And that, I think, the comparative part is what makes the tool really uh, interesting because, you know, it's kind of, well, I built the tool as a builder, so it very much follows the process of building. You know, you kind of build a model from the ground up. You build it assembly by assembly, and you know the all the materials that you might use for a certain piece of an assembly are are all listed right beside each other, and so you can kind of immediately compare. You know, if you're on the roofing tab, you know you've got how much square footage of roofing you have is already in the tool, and so you're seeing all your roofing options and their carbon footprint all side by side. And then you sort of make your selections to make your model, but you, you get to see, you know, the, the, the the climate impact of all the materials in a really great comparative way. And I think that's the the feedback we've been getting is that's, what's really helpful people getting that aha moment of, Whoa, look at the difference between this and that. I never thought of that before. Whereas, you know, lots of the other tools you kind of, you build a model and you get an answer at the end and you kind of, you see the carbon footprint of the material you've just selected, but you don't know what the ones, the other ones you might have chosen are. And so you kind of have to keep iterating by going back and forth. And I just, I really wanted it all in front of people. So it, it, um, yeah, I think it's been helping. We've been getting, uh, you know, lots of people sending us models back and, um, we've actually seen some people starting to uh, send us models of buildings that are sort of, you know, at or close to net zero uh, emissions from their materials. So yeah, it's really, it's exciting. Nice. I I definitely agree. I was, I was playing with it uh, last week um, and just, yeah, the ability to switch on and off, you know, maybe I'm using wood fiber, maybe I'm using cellulose uh, and flicking between the two and seeing, well, obviously I want to use this one. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it really is. Um, I, it's sort of a, a sort of shopping list, really. You know, this mm-hmm. is this is what you could have. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I really like that. Um, was there, did you have anyone that it was sort of aimed at? Were you specifically making it for, for designers or builders? or? Um, I guess both designers, builders. Um, in, in Canada, there's sort of a, a third profession of uh, energy advisors so in a lot of cases now you have to kind of send an energy model in to get your building permit in a lot of provinces and so you already have people who are kind of making a model of the building they kind of have all the inputs that you would put into beam already done in order to make this energy model and so you know they they're sort of a, a third logical user because quite often that's who either the the builder or the designer is turning to, to say what's the sort of energy use slash carbon footprint of this building on the operation side. And so, you know, that's a, an audience that's kind of already thinking 
climate and, you know, how does this building perform that way? And so uh, a lot of the users are our energy advisors. And then, so you were talking about operational carbon there. This tool is is just material carbon. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But we very much see, you know, that you would want to put those two things together. Like you kind of want to have both of those results and, you know, stand them side by side. And that's why it's been, the tool has been really interesting for energy advisors because they can kind of make a model in whatever software they're using, whether it's Passive House or, you know, Hot 2000 or ResNet or, you know, whatever it is. And then they make this beam model and then you start to kind of see what are the, what are the maybe trade-offs or like where do you get win-win scenarios? Where do things not actually pay back? Like, you know, making a an incremental performance difference on the energy side at the cost of a huge amount of material carbon. When you see those things beside each other, you're like, oh, that's not the best way to, you know, to sort of manage the the kind of carbon budget for this building. And so I think that's so ideally we will connect Beam so that it 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 can interface directly with some of those um energy modeling softwares. I feel like that's kind of our next step. Uh but now it's kind of a, a parallel tool that that is quite often getting used alongside whatever the energy modeling tool is. And then it's uh I mean it's really simple to use. I was I was a little bit daunted when I first opened it because there's yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to it there's a lot of that's... stuff but it, it's the it's pretty straightforward once you get the the logic of it yeah yes yeah absolutely oh I, yeah I, and I, it had I, to be because you know like i i i'm not a software person <laughs> um and i very much you know wanted to the the early versions were designed for me who knows nothing about spreadsheets or software to be able to use easily and i think that kind of made made its way through to the final version that that it, it needed to be pretty simple to approach yeah um and you've um you've gone for an interesting route in terms of uh funding uh for this or sort of payment i guess yeah yeah we i mean we um we just decided to make it you know not put it behind a paywall um allow people to access it for free and then kind of ask people to you know support us and, and it's sort of ongoing development voluntarily, which has maybe not worked quite as well as we thought. There hasn't been uh, <laughs> quite the response. I mean, there have been some people have been really generous and, and that's been great. Um, but we'll sort of have to see if that if that model continues, because we, you know, we really do want to keep developing the tool. I think this is very much a, a an early version and, and we have a big list of things that we we want to do to to sort of grow it and improve it so we'll have to see if that kind of voluntary support if it if that doesn't pan out then we may have to look at at other ways of of funding it sure yeah um and what i mean what are some of those uh future developments that you'd like to to add in well i think first would be connecting having it connect easily to to other software programs so whether that's design uh, related software or energy modeling software you know right now you kind of have to a user of beam has to input all the dimensions of the building and then select all the materials and quite often you've already done that somewhere else and so you know that a great first step would be to you know have it that you could export from from other software programs and have a lot of that information populate right into beam um, more materials, uh, even a, a more sort of user-friendly interface. We kind of based it on Google Sheets because it was a, uh, you know, an affordable and and sort of practical medium between like just having an Excel sheet on your desktop and and like a full, um, you know, developed software. Um, but there are definitely some limitations to you know, like you said, when you open it up, you're sort of overwhelmed because the foundations tab has, you know, like 500 materials listed and you have to do a lot of scrolling, even just simple things like having those menus be able to collapse so that you can kind of see all the top level stuff right away and only open the ones that make sense to you. And so just some really practical user uh, friendly things like that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, is the is the tool location specific? You're obviously based in Canada. Are the uh, the emissions going to be similar for me uh, in the UK? In general, not too far off. I mean, we did we really did concentrate on on uh, EPDs from North America. Mm-hmm. Um, and in cases like we we will use sort of uh, UK or or European products, either where that's what actually gets used in North America. So, for example, you know, wood fiber products, nobody's really making that in North America, so they are being imported. Um, lots of uh, triple pane windows used in North America are coming from Europe. So, or sometimes we would sort of default to a European value if. There is a similar product in North America, but nobody's made EPDs for the North American version. Mm-hmm. In general, it actually seems like the European values tend to be a little bit lower. Um, I think maybe because grids are are cleaner in North America, or sorry, in Europe, than especially often in manufacturing heavy states in the U.S., where there's still a lot of coal, so there there is some um some variation there but in general they're not bad proxies for one another mm-hmm. definitely you know if you if you think about it in terms of scale and comparison right so if there's you know i i try to tell people this in terms of looking at the numbers that the numbers what you get from an epd and therefore what you get from beam like you shouldn't think of it as like this accurate number like if it says you know 12 kilograms of co2e it's probably not exactly 12 but if this product is 12 and this one is 25 like this one is better than this one um it may be by 13 kilograms it may be by 10 but you know but it's um it's not you know it's not it's more accurate on a sort of comparison basis than it is like to the exact number. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and then with those, um, those materials that are transported, say, you know, the triple pane window, mm-hmm. uh, is the transportation uh, emissions accounted for within that? No, we're, we're not doing that in beam. And, and that's something we really struggled with in terms of should we, or shouldn't we? And, you know, quite often there is that an assumption about that transportation emissions is built into the EPD. But when we really started to try to unpack that and see whether that was a value that we, you know, should maybe be using, that the three case studies that we dug into in depth to sort of explore that all came back that the that, that that sort of assumption was actually very, very wrong. <laughs> and we started thinking, well, if you start giving people these numbers based on potentially very wrong assumptions, that can often be worse than just not giving the data. You know, like I think in general, people have a sense of if I'm importing something from further away, there are more emissions and they would sort of bake that maybe into their decisions. And I also think that there's a a cost that have like a financial cost that happens that also limits, you know, Mm -hmm. people's ability and willingness to, to sort of like splurge on those emissions. Um, But yeah, when we, when we sort of looked at the, the case studies um, yeah, they were, they were remarkably off like by degrees of magnitude because, you know, the, the EPDs and any life cycle assessments, what they do is say, well, you know, here's a factory. So if, if, if I've located, you know, said my location is here, they kind of find the closest factory. They, they look at the distance between there and they go, okay, so it's probably going to go by truck and it's going this many kilometers. But when we actually traced how those materials moved, they don't go from the factory to my building site. They go from a factory to some sort of warehouse clearing site to then some retailers warehouse clearing site, then to the retailer and then to me. And it's like, Oh, that was five times further than, (laughs) than that assumption. Or the other way that those calculations get done is, you know, the, on the EPD, the factory will say, well, we, we send it out 
we send out this many trucks and they go this far. And that, so the average distance is this, which is not really a helpful number if you know, you're either really close to the factory or really far from the factory and, and their trucks aren't the only trucks that carry that stuff. Like they they might be shipping it to, you know, uh, a central warehouse for a Home Depot or a place like that, that's then sending it to a sub thing, then to another thing, and then to a store. So a very long winded way of saying, I think the transportation emissions are important, but I think the ability to reflect them in a, in an easy number in a software was misleading more often than it was accurate. And so, you know, we thought better to stick to the numbers that we have confidence in and that give people like a strong sense of this and, you know, either later or somebody else or, you know, people in, in house using beam will, will kind of figure that, that other part out. Um, the other interesting thing about the transportation emissions is they ended up in all of our case studies being relatively small compared to the, to the product emissions. Like oh, typically five to 10% of, of the, the kind of upfront emissions, you know, were transportation, which again, like I don't want to ignore that and say it's not important, but, but it's not as important uh, or it doesn't appear to be uh, at this point. So, um, yeah. you know, yeah, like I would, I do and want to pay attention to that. And I think people should, but I feel like it, it's not maybe the top priority. And if you want to do it, you're going to have to figure it out yourself so that, you know, you're figuring it out properly to your, to your site and conditions. Yes. You have said that um, the, you know, the estimation that comes out of beam is going to be an under representation because there's certain things you can't, Mm -hmm. uh, including transportation. Um, So I guess I'm sort of asking you about uh, the limitations of beam Mm -hmm. um are there are there other kind of ones that people should be aware of yeah i think i mean there's it's funny that because i developed beam to be part of you know our sort of in-house toolkit for for looking at materials as broadly as possible you know and so to do that had to do this deep dive into this particular thing, you know, embodied carbon and and material emissions. But, but I think it's really important that, that we don't just focus on that one lens. Like it's, this gives us a really good piece of information and then we want to put it alongside energy efficiency. We want to put it alongside material health and sort of, you know, indoor air quality and those sorts of things. We want to put it alongside, what happens to this stuff at the end of its life? Like, you know, the embodied carbon number is a really valuable number, but it's kind of not the only consideration. So it's not so much a limitation of beam because beam is only saying one thing and it says that one thing really well, but it is just one thing. And so, you know, one of the things that that beam does not do that I think people need to really be aware of is think about, the the lifespan of the materials in it so you know here in north america asphalt shingles are you know the most common roofing for small buildings they also look really great in beam the the carbon footprint of them actually isn't that high but what beam's not telling you is oh you're gonna have to change those in 15 years or 20 years max whereas maybe the metal roof which if you just look at the beam number it's like oh metal is way higher than these asphalt shingles you know the shingles must be better you know, you have to know that, oh, over the lifespan of the building, I might never change the metal roofing, but I'm going to change the shingles three, four or five times. So actually that number should be, you know, three or four or five times higher. Um, And, you know, so there are a few things like that. By and large, Beam only models long lasting materials in the building. Like we don't, that's why we sort of didn't get into paints and you know surface finishes and um you know kitchen counters and things like that 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 do tend to get swapped out more frequently we we sort of concentrated on on the materials that aren't going to change but even within that there are things you know roofing being one of them where the 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 lifespan of the material matters but it's not something that that beam is sort of telling you 
yeah it must have been incredibly difficult to decide what should go in and what shouldn't like yeah yeah we we want the most accurate best thing we can yeah uh yeah yeah and you know it's it was one of my beefs with a lot of life cycle assessment software and to be honest the life cycle assessment process in general is that you know when when you try to do this full life cycle assessment so you know our asphalt shingle example is a good one an lca would say well let's say the building's going to last 60 years you're going to have to change those shingles three times so the kind of like final number for that building includes three shingle changes but it also assumes that you're going to change that to shingles <laughs> and that shingles are going to have the same carbon footprint in 15 or 20 years. And then again in 40 or 50 years. And so, you know, I think it's important that we think about how long materials last and what happens to them. But I also think it's wrong headed to, to sort of like bake in this number that like, what if the first person who changes their shingles puts a metal roof on like if you've given them this number that assumes x number of shingle changes that's not accurate either what happens if in the next 10 years somebody comes up with a great cheap bio-based roofing system that's carbon storing and everybody switches to that like you know so they're they're you know in in trying to address the climate like today's emissions are critical it's like lowering what comes out of you know factories and goes into the sky today is like number one priority and even something as short-lived as asphalt shingles a lot can change in 15 years and you know in the end we decided we don't want to lock this we don't want to sort of force people to be making decisions right now that based on our assumptions you know even even end of life scenarios and in life cycle assessment you're predicting the emissions that are going to come from taking this building apart in 60 or 80 years, but 60 or 80 years ago from today, there weren't even recycling programs, you know? And, and so really every assumption we're making about those emissions is probably wrong. And it's a funny thing of you don't want people to not think about those long-term consequences, but as soon as you start saying, and here's the number that goes with that consequence like it just feels like wow it that's going to be completely inaccurate and indefensible <laughs> so <laughs> yeah i think so you know in 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 my work and as we talk to people about being like we want to make it clear that that tension exists like we're only telling you this thing we think it's really important because this is a lot of emissions and they happen now all kinds of other things you know matter but but we're not going to try to give you a number for it because we don't think we can, but we don't also want to downplay the importance. So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, yeah. I'm impressed with the, uh, well, just how complex it is to, to yeah. do, do the right thing, I guess is the, yeah. is the, the goal, isn't it? Um, so, so I, when I, I was modeling my, uh, my house, my house is a little tiny house that sits on a, a 600 kilogram trailer uh, a metal trailer so i was kind of thinking i wonder if i've uh you know everything else except the 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 metal roof and the membrane is is bio-based and so i was thinking you know i wonder if i've i've done enough to offset the the horrible metal um and i was quite surprised that um things like uh wood fiber insulation and the cork um were scoring a zero uh, in terms of emissions and it seemed like they should either have a positive or a or a, a storage number. I mean, maybe I just didn't get the the uh, calculator right. Yes, I think you didn't. There shouldn't be oh, a, oh, no. a zero <laughs> <laughs> anywhere. Um, the the number one thing that that happens with people is, especially around insulation materials, is you have to specify an R value in Beam before you'll get results. Right. Okay, right. um, and so if you see zeros, it's because there's an additional factor. Sometimes it's like the thickness of the material or if it's for framing, like you have to specify framing spacing or if it's insulation, you have to specify an R value and then it'll populate because that's sort of the the third piece of the equation that it that it needs to do that. 
Okay, good. All yeah. right, more time <laughs> needed. And I suppose yeah. that leads nicely on to talking that um, that there is training available for these. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been doing um, a three part uh, live online training session. Um, so people can find the next dates on our website. And we're sort of working towards a, a sort of strictly online version of that uh, as well. So, yes. Well, it seems like I should I should probably get on one of those. <laughs> <laughs> We also did the thing of making, you know, a 90 page user's guide that I think, as with all user's guides, nobody ever uses, but it's, uh, it is pretty I, extensive too. <laughs> I read the first few pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, that's, that's exciting that I've got more, uh, more to play with. Yeah. As previous guests have been hesitant um, in allowing uh, stored carbon to be used to, to offset having a big concrete block and then you know filling it with with biogenic material mm-hmm. could be used by less scrupulous developers to um to essentially sort of fiddle the numbers um how do you feel about that um i don't feel like it's fiddling the numbers and i actually feel like it's a it's actually a reasonable strategy today like you know the climate the climate responds to the amount of greenhouse gases in it. And if you, you know, at the same time as you emit a bunch to make the concrete for your building, if you have drawn the same amount, say, out in your bio-based materials, you you have, in effect, you know, made a climate neutral building. And so as a strategy, I think that's a very reasonable strategy, especially right now when you know, for smaller buildings, there are lots of options to get away from concrete. In larger buildings, there really aren't. And, you know, lots of people are working on that and and hopefully, you know, uh, better, more climate friendly versions of that material will will start to appear. Um, but until then, you know, I think I think that strategy of using the high emitting materials where you absolutely need to and using as many bio-based materials as you can otherwise is, is entirely reasonable. I mean, the unscrupulous person just wouldn't care and would just use all high emitting materials. (laughs) So, you know, I don't, I don't see it as unscrupulous. I see it as a, you know, as a, as an important strategy for, uh, for sort of managing our climate impacts right now. And, and even sort of over specifying the bio based materials maybe when they're not necessary with that would you still count that as a as a positive yeah i mean i think I think you know people have sort of given me those scenarios before well, no, you could just make three foot thick you know straw walls, and it's like, well, that will cost you enough that you probably won't just arbitrarily you know over use those materials, I think like cost is a defining factor of any building and i think there are real limitations to how much somebody would game the numbers um but quite frankly you know if you had somebody building a a a carbon withdrawal machine out of the air you wouldn't say oh if you run that at twice the speed you're cheating (laughs) it's like well no if we if we need to get a whole bunch of carbon out of the atmosphere and and stored somewhere if if it suits you to spend enough money to make three foot thick straw walls, great. Like, <laughs> you know, you could also stop driving your car around and, you know, do lots of other things, but, but that's a strategy and it will work. And that, that, you know, three foot thick wall will keep that amount of carbon out of the atmosphere for as long as those walls exist. And that, that's a, that's a val a value to the climate. So um, you know, I, I think I think that that given given the sort of the bounds that that those strategies have in terms of practicality and cost, I, I, I think any any legit strategy that somebody can afford and will actually do is is a legit strategy. Great. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you've also noted that um, virgin forest products. Uh, do not score a, a sort of sequestration uh, number. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's what's the the reasoning behind that? Um, that again was just like a 
you know, we tried to do a deep dive into, into like, what is carbon storage and is it even valuable? You know, that was a, a question that needed to be answered first on all the bio-based materials. And what became really clear was that, you know, short cycle, things that grow on really short cycles, and in particular, things that grow on short cycles where what you're using in the building is the is the sort of um, residue or byproduct or, um, you know, a sort of secondary uh, result of that. So, you know, straw is a great example. You know, we grow two plus billion tons of, of grain straw globally every year. We cut the little tiny seed head off the top of that to, you know, to, to eat. And then the whole stock is left over. So annually, all that grain straw draws down the emissions of India. That's there's 4 billion tons of CO2 pulled out of the atmosphere every year. No land use change. Like this is like, it's already happening. Farmers are already planting it. They're fertilizing it. They're, they're harvesting it. And then they're either burning it off or letting it rot off the vast majority of it. And so we, we intentionally pull down India's emissions every year and then just as intentionally let them go back to the atmosphere. And so when you're doing that, then that, that carbon storage is meaningful. Like if we could keep half of that straw and put it in buildings, then we're offsetting half of India's emissions every year. That's, that's meaningful. When you think about forests, it gets way more complicated because the trees that we're cutting down, if we didn't cut them down, would keep living, keep getting bigger and keep drawing down carbon. You know, that if we didn't do anything with the straw, it dies at the end of the season. Like it's, that's not going to draw any more CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's done. Whereas a tree is, you know, we're typically harvesting them mid lifespan and they have a lot more CO2 they could draw down. So there's that factor. When we cut down a tree, less than half of it typically makes it into a building material. Um, you've got the, the, you know, the branches, the slash, like all the stuff that gets left in the forest. You've got the root mass that stays in the ground. And then you've got all the stuff that gets sawed off to turn it into square lumber. A lot of that gets burned to, in the kilns to, to dry the wood. So you know, say it's a 50-50 balance, half the tree makes it into your building and half the tree, the carbon went back to the atmosphere. There's no net carbon storage there and you've lost an ongoing carbon sink and we haven't calculated how much carbon came out of the soil when you did that logging operation and exposed all the ground to, you know, the atmosphere again. So I think there's probably a way that that timber products can be harvested that is would be of value to the climate. There's nobody is looking broadly enough at it. Like the life cycle assessment for for forestry doesn't account for a lot of that stuff that I've just described and until it does it it doesn't seem like we should be saying that it, you know, it does have carbon in it. Like that part's easy. I can say this two by four has this many carbon atoms in it, like this, you know, this weight of carbon, but, but whether putting it in the building helped the climate, there, there's just not enough evidence to, to sort of prove that. And, and I think, you know, seeing the way forestry is done, at least in North America, I'm pretty sure it's not, you know, it's, it's not really like for, for timber products, to be carbon storing the forests as as sort of carbon sinks themselves have to continue to get bigger like you can't shrink the, the the carbon sink of a forest and move some of that carbon into buildings and say we help the climate like all you did was move carbon atoms if we can have forests continue to either maintain or ideally grow their carbon stocks while taking trees out that's you know, that could be meaningful carbon storage, but you know, there's, there's no life cycle data to show that that's, that is what's happening. So for now, we just leave it out of being. We'll be back after a quick break. Hey there, I'm Mick from the Mick and Pat show. 
That's right. And I'm Pat. Looking for a podcast that's like catching up with old friends? Well, you're in luck. We're here to bring you weekly doses of lifestyle commentary, discuss culture and politics, and top it off with the occasional beer and film reviews. But it's not just about us. We're a community. Our listeners are our kin, and we let you all have a say in what we discuss. So saddle up and join the conversation at The Mick and Pat Show. You can check out our website or find us wherever you get your podcasts. That's, yeah, that makes total sense. Um, yes, I did notice that my, uh, the, the calculations for my hardwood flooring were, uh, I was <laughs> a little, little upset. <laughs> I thought, ah, oh, it's got to be a good thing. <laughs> Not really. Yeah. And then, so, so there's another kind of category of materials that sort of fall somewhere in between those two, right? Things like bamboo and cork where the, the, the cycle, it's not an annual crop, but it's shorter than the, you know, 30 to 50 years of timber. Um, and the harvesting doesn't cause the same kind of carbon releases. Like when you harvest bamboo, there really aren't any branches that you, you know, you kind of use the whole thing. The root stays in the ground. The root is what grows the next shoot of bamboo. Um, and the, the cycle is shorter, sort of like eight to 10 years. So, you know, if you look in beam, the bamboo flooring has carbon storage and the hardwood flooring doesn't. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you made your hardwood flooring by like, you know, a tree fell, you know, down behind your house and you milled it up and and turned it into hardwood flooring or you know or or you got it from a uh you know, a, a wood lot where somebody is managing and maintaining that wood lot and and is continuing to kind of grow the forest while extracting some wood mm -hmm. i think you could attribute carbon storage to that but that's those are very specific cases you know it's yes it's not yeah. All right. Well, mine might not be so bad. We've got uh, ash ash dieback over here, so all of our ash trees right. are yeah have got a fungus infection. Uh, yeah, and it all came from from trees that were were infected and going to be you know were going to come down because yeah. of that. So maybe yeah. it's not so bad. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that we you can do in Beam is we have our sort of that little percentage column and. We, we sort of, when people ask about, you know, recycled materials or in the case of, of the flooring you're describing, you can sort of, you select the material, but if you call it 0%, um, you'll kind of like make it carbon neutral, but it will still show up as a selection when you're kind of like, you know, reviewing the model at the end. It's not like leaving it out, like, well, what flooring did they use? There's no flooring here. But, you know, so it'll show hardwood flooring, but it'll show like a zero uh, impact. And, and I think for cases where, where there are, you know, real like meaningful exemptions like that or, or where, where the sourcing is not conventional and, and you could really um, say that that's a, a carbon neutral option, then, then that, that you can sort of manipulate Beam to do that. Oh, oh, I'm excited. I'm going to have a major, <laughs> major geek out. <laughs> um, so, um, so you've used Beam in in two big studies into uh, Canadian housing um, mm -hmm. that I was I was reading. Um, do you want to tell us about about sort of what those studies were and and how they came about? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We actually the first spin of Beam was we did a, a study for the federal government here in Canada that. Um, they gave us sort of some model houses and we, you know, we ran those, uh, through beam and then the, the Toronto study and the, the one for Nelson, British Columbia that you mentioned. And we actually just finished one for Vancouver as well. Um, in those cases, we were, we got sort of actual plan sets from, from builders and developers in those regions and kind of ran those plan sets through beam. And yeah, that it's, you know, it's been really interesting to get real results from real homes um and, we've and these, kind of these found, aren't sort of you know eco nope. or not, you know these are just regular these regular are just homes. yeah yeah you know the the toronto study in particular it was it was almost all sort of track developer kind of uh homes and yeah i mean what you know one of the interesting things is that the the sort of the the average emissions from the materials from those homes across all of those studies actually fell into a pretty 
narrow range. Um, you know, Toronto and Vancouver were only like a couple of kilograms of emissions off uh, on their average. So, and that's, you know, very different climate zones and, you know, styles of building and, and stuff like that. So, you know, one of the outputs is just, oh, look, like there actually kind of is an average here um, that we could use. Uh, ideally, you know, what we're trying to do is get regulators to look at that and go, let's start, you know, first voluntarily incentivizing people to come in under that average, but eventually sort of regulate this, these emissions um, using this kind of data. But we also found, you know, houses that had as much as like over 500 kilograms of emissions per square meter. Um, we had one in the Nelson study that was 72, you know, which was a great result. Um, and sort of like 190 was, had, was the average for both Toronto and Vancouver. Um, so I think that starts to give us a sense of, you know, especially for people who are now using Beam, like you get this number, but is this a good number? <laughs> like a not good number? You know, am I better than average, worse than average? So those studies start to help, you know, give us some perspective on that. Like where, where does business as usual kind of practice land right now? And, and then what, what kinds of things can we do to change that? And, you know, for each of those studies, we kind of took as built models and did some material swaps to see what, what we could achieve. And, you know, in the Toronto study, a handful of material changes, sort of like five changes could drop the carbon footprint by like 50 to 75%. And so, you know, that, that gives us a sense that, you know, there's a bunch of low hanging fruit here. And again, for the people on the, the sort of policy and regulation side, the, the, the sense that, you know, you could, you could push this in a really great direction and it's not onerous on the, the builders or um, developers to be able to do that. Yeah. I think that one of the, the really interesting things from the Toronto study was that there was one development company whose, whose houses came in at 40% less than the average, just like that's their business as usual. They weren't trying to make a lower carbon house. They, they're competing in the same market as the other developers. Their, you know, their buildings are the same price, but just by sort of in in their case, the luck of you know the materials they've chosen, they come in that much lower. But you know, to me, it's like well, if if Toronto's you know climate targets are forty percent reductions by twenty thirty. And there's already a development company that's 40% less than the average. It's like everybody then should be able to get to that 40% target by 2030. Like that's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make it appear like this should be any kind of hurdle at all. And, and then the that's models really that we made that showed, that? yeah, the models that we, you know, we made that showed like 50 to 75% reductions and you want to hit that by 2040 or 2050, like all, like all of this seems, it makes it seem very achievable, at least in terms of kind of like moving the, the mainstream of the industry to, to levels like that. Um, so yeah, th I think those studies were to me, I mean, in some ways depressing because, you know, in Toronto, it showed that just low rise home building is about a million metric tons of emissions a year, the, the materials. So it's like, Oh, this is a really big problem. But then at the same time, it's like, oh, and we can really start to mitigate that, you know, quickly and relatively easily. So it was kind of like bad news, good news uh, study. <laughs> <laughs> um, you you talked a little bit about the the materials you could swap out. Um, you have them listed in the reports as the best available and the best possible. What's the the sort of distinction between those two? Yeah, so we made the best available model to. Um, to show substitutions to materials that, you know, uh, a builder could, you know, reasonably have access to through existing channels. So the supply chain is there, that those materials are code compliant and, you know, cost competitive. In some cases, they are a bit more. In some cases, they're less, but like, you know, they're, they're kind of within the, the, the range of, of reasonable costs. So we wanted to make a model like if you wanted to switch your practice tomorrow you could go to the store and you know um, these aren't materials that would require your 
crews to learn anything new or your supply chains to really change. It's sort of more like product switches. And then the best possible materials is kind of that sort of next generation uh, where the materials maybe aren't there. And so, you know, for example, straw insulation was, was one of the key ones. And, you know, I've been doing that here for 25 years. So have lots of other people, it's not like it's not doable. So that was sort of our, our rule with making that model was we had to be suggesting materials that already have been used in code approved buildings here, but like you can't go to the Home Depot and get your straw bales or your chopped straw insulation right now, or your compressed straw board wall panel, you know, material for interior walls. We know those materials exist and, and people are using them and making them. So they're possible, but they, they're, they're not, accessible today so we kind of made both of those and it, there's kind of a progression you know that the best available model is what got us those 50 to 75 percent reductions and the best possible is what gets us into you know net zero emission material buildings or net carbon storing buildings and so you know we wanted to kind of point to those as this is where we need to get to but we can't jump right there tomorrow Yes. I, I guess following on from that, is there um, is, is there a product that that's soon to be bridging that gap, or, or something you're excited about that you've seen sort of in development that could? I, make I'm I'm those excited those... about so many things yeah. <laughs> these days. <laughs> Good, um, you know the the things that people are doing with mycelium composite materials is amazing. Um, there's a company that's that's making a Mostly the mycelium materials I've seen have been sort of insulation, which is great. Uh, it's kind of like lightweight, soft material um, that's got all kinds of great properties. Um, but uh, there's a company that's, that's growing a mycelium composite that that is you know almost as strong as lumber. Um, that gets exciting to me that they're growing the equivalent of a two by four using waste biomass and a like three day growing period versus <laughs> having to go out to forests and, you know, mow down the forest to make that two by four like that. So to me, that is really exciting. Um, a lot of the things that are going on with um, bio biologically based uh, cements and concretes. So you've got, you know, biomason making uh, micro grown bricks. You've got um, the living materials laboratory doing sort of algae based concrete and also using algae to grow calcium carbonate to go, you know, to, to make uh, concrete out of um, that kind of stuff is, is really exciting. And then I feel like, you know, there are some unsung heroes like straw where there are some great companies making prefab straw based, you know, uh, exterior walls, interior walls. And to me, it's like that, that's such a scalable idea. It's been so well proven. It would make such a huge difference, um, not just to the carbon footprint, but to income for farmers. It would, you know, lower the waste burden on houses. It eliminates a whole whack of toxic materials that often get built in. Like there are so many advantages and it seems so easy and straightforward. And I, I still, I kind of like shake my head that there isn't a, a straw panel factory in you know every town and state like <laughs> it really seems like it, it's something that that it's so easy to do and it makes such a big difference and the technology is ripe and the costs are competitive and you know it's it's just needs whatever the kick in the pants it needs to kind of get over that line uh, of mainstream acceptance um, I think there's a lot of materials kind of in that in that realm of you know things like uh, hempcrete and the hemp wool insulation and you know lots of lots of products like that where they are products right now they're just being made by really small companies in really limited quantities and and could be so much more than that. Yeah. Oh, that was that's a very pleasing answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I wanted to chat uh, about your book. I'm conscious that we're we're running out of time, but um, yes. So you've you've got a new book uh, just come out uh, yourself and, and Bruce King. Um, what, what's that all about? Yeah, so it's called Build Beyond Zero, and it's it's basically um, 
the the kind of positive enthusiasm I just gave you on what's possible in the world of building. This is Bruce and I, you know, really just riffing on that um, from the material point of view, from codes to you know, kind of looking at the the sort of building. Um, industry and and its regulation, like the whole package, and going, you know, we have this potential here um, to take the industry that is contributing most to climate change or among the the most uh, heavy contributors and turn it into like a a, a a climate healer in terms of you know really um, consciously putting atmospheric carbon away in buildings. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of our uh, you know, roadmap to a this is doable, and b like this is you know some of the the ways and materials and and kind of structures that we would need to to get there. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've I've I was reading that you've got a, a huge amount of uh, external contributors on the book. Yeah, um, yeah, we had a we had a lot of um, you know there are so many smart people working in this space that we are like, well, we don't know all of this. So yeah, we had, we had really great contributors sort of uh, talking about, you know, specifically the, the kinds of things they're doing and the, the ideas that, that they're kind of working with. And, nice. And, and then who's, who do you think the book is, is for? Um, I think it's for, you know, anybody in the building industry. I think it'll get read a lot by, you know, architects and engineers. I'm hoping it gets read by builders. I'm hoping it gets read by, uh, you know, climate activists in general. Because, you know, if you're a if you're a climate activist, this is a space where, you know, that that the difference we could make is real. You know, if you think about other industries of this scale of construction, their emissions are really, 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 really hard to mitigate, and yet. The construction industry is is staring down this possibility of being able to like get its emissions down to nothing and potentially become the sixth big carbon bank in the of the planet. Um, you know, so so if you're even if you're not a builder, if you're a climate activist, this is the place to be active because if we can if we can sort of get the industry moving quickly in that direction, now I think that's that's our biggest, that will be our biggest and quickest win. And um, so we just hope that anybody that has an interest in, <laughs> in finding those kind of climate wins will, uh, will pick up the book. Nice. Great. Um, so I've got just a couple of very quick questions sure. just on uh, sort of actually, cause I'm, I think I said on my intro to, uh, to your, the last time you were on the podcast is that you seem to be, I think the hardest working person in in the sort of sustainable construction world. You seem to be doing so much. I um, mean, what what is it that drives you to do this? Um, I think I think just a like a genuine excitement at what's possible. You know, I mean that's that's how I started building. I you know read a thing about straw bale houses and thought that seems really possible. I'm going to do that. And and sort of every step along the way, it's been like you know, one thing leads to the next and you're like, oh, it would be possible to do this. Uh, oh, it would be possible to do that. And, you know, I think right now in with Beam and and the book and these reports, it's like seeing that it, it really is possible to um, transform the kind of the emissions profile and status of, of buildings is, it's it's exciting. And, and you know, I just... If it's possible, it seems like, well, then let's do it. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and then um, uh, what's what's next? What's what's the sort of big, exciting things, if there's anything you can talk about? Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, for me, it's that I have uh, joined the Rocky Mountain Institute. And so I'm going to be sort of continuing to do uh, all of this really great sort of buildings and climate work um, with them which, you know, is a, they're an amazing organization with a, uh, a huge reach and a, and a lot of uh, internal strengths and supports. And so it's exciting to, to start, you know, yeah, continuing to do this work, but with, with a, you know, a, a really strong organization uh, supporting it is, it's really, I'm looking forward to what's possible 
when it's you know not just coming out of a two-person organization, but a <laughs> a really strong you know hundreds of people organization. And what what is the Rocky Mountain Institute? Uh, RMI is a uh, it's a not-for-profit sort of um, they call themselves a think and do tank. So <laughs> it's like you know um, you know thinking a lot about. Uh, energy and the energy transformation and and policy work but with a strong connection to putting examples on the ground and you know actually you know accomplishing uh real world things as well as as policy things nice that's yeah perfect yeah um, uh, and my my final question that i don't think i even really need to ask but i i wrote it down so um uh, are you hopeful <laughs> Ah, depends on the day or minute that you you ask that question. I mean, you know, no, a lot of the time, um, and then yes, some of the time. Uh, you know, I'm not hopeful that that we sort of get climate change under control fast enough that that we avert like all the really terrible things maybe we can get it under control to avert the absolute worst of the terrible things or we figure out ways that we're going to deal with some of the terrible repercussions um but you know the, on the hopeful days it's thinking well you know when i started looking at say the carbon footprint of building materials was 2016 nobody had really thought of it, heard about it. It was a very tiny community of people who'd spent any time studying it. And now I'm working with cities to help regulate it like that. You know, all of that happened quickly. Are they regulating it strictly enough or quickly enough? No, but, but it's on their radar and they're doing it, you know, federal governments are looking at it like it, you know, it's, it's encouraging how quickly all of the climate related stuff has like moved high up on the agenda, but I also don't think it's you know enough or, or, <laughs> or fast enough. So yeah, it's kind of, uh, <laughs> it, it, we will, we will make some huge changes in the next decades and they probably won't be enough to avert the worst of it. And I guess just like at any other point in human history, we'll deal with the fallout from all of our unintended consequences. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chris. Um, I, it feels a bit funny to end on a bit of a, uh, maybe a realistic note. Um, it, I personally felt, quite comforted by the the fact that i'm not alone in the feelings of of feeling just a little bit like we're we're not doing enough and even though our our industry is our particular you uh natural building industry is doing really well and sort of has the solutions and has all this this sort of positivity uh things at large don't seem to be happening and it's yeah it's a bit hard not to be uh kind of swamped by that i think um i thought chris articulated that very well and very honestly um and i appreciate that um also just yeah get on the beam calculator if you've got any kind of building project um as he says the ability to see you know if i just switch out this this material for that one I will be saving this this much carbon is is really really powerful um really helps you to quite quickly uh zone in on on what's the the best for your project and yeah I'm very pleased that it exists now uh, I wish it had been around uh when I had been designing my house but you can't have everything can you I have a lovely house um okay so there are links in the show notes to uh beam the beam calculator uh the builders for climate action which is chris's company which uh created the calculator links also to the rocky mountain institute chris's new book 
Um, I'll stick a few links to other books as well. If I can find some, there'll be links to Biomason, which were the bio bricks, and the Living Materials Laboratory, uh, looking at algae concrete. I think that's about it for me. I just want to end on saying that uh, I think regular listeners will have noticed in the last couple of months that I have been a little bit slack on regular episodes. If I'm honest, I'm uh, I'm really struggling to to find the drive needed uh, to do the podcast. Um, I think it's partly finishing my house um, and that's raising my 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 sort of eyes to the horizon and, and thinking about what I'm doing next. And there's some sort of uh, concern within that, I guess. Um, but yes, but what I've got is I've got three more episodes. They're all in the bank. Uh, I'm going to try and get those out pretty quickly. And then I'm going to have a bit of a break uh, and head off and do some different things and then come back stronger. Uh, so, yes, thank you all. Um, especially thank you to uh, all the people that have been saying lovely things to me uh, via email and LinkedIn and, and all the other places you can contact me. Really is uh, very appreciated. Um, yes. So, end on a good note. Uh, I'm living in my house and I just had the electrician round today who's finally wired in all my plug sockets. So I can boil a kettle actually on my kitchen work surface rather than in a cupboard uh, where the extension cable was plugged into. It feels pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I'm smiling. <laughs> all right. Until next time, which hopefully should be soon. See ya.